Well, good morning, family church. I will say you guys look a lot better up here than from back there. And for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, I usually run sound. <laughs> so uh, my name is John Fogarty. So this, you guys are my first group, so welcome to the experiment. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So is it too soon to say happy Thanksgiving? Oh good, because I hope not. I've got a sermon that is filled with tips, tricks, and all kinds of helpful and useful information to make sure our, we have a smooth Thanksgiving. We're gonna be ta- covering topics such as how the 2020 election was stolen, <laughs> pronouns, and what is a woman? No, don't worry. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We're not going to be covering those topics this morning. But if some of those topics did pique your interest, please see Terry after service. (laughs) He'll be more than happy to give you some more information on those and some other fire-starting conversation topics. But in all seriousness, this morning, we're going to be covering Psalm 100. And this psalm is also known as Old 100, and it is a psalm of thanksgiving. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 100. And I've entitled this psalm, A Psalm of Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving. But before we dive in, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it is such an honor and privilege to be able to gather together as the body of Christ, to be able to come here and freely worship you as we just got done doing, Lord. May we not just reserve that for Sunday morning, but may we praise your holy name every day of the week because you are so worthy of it, Lord. I ask as we get ready to hear your word being preached, that you would prepare our minds and our hearts, that any distractions may be removed. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would move mightily in our hearts and that you would convict us of any sin that resides in there. And may we confess them to you and give them up. Father, I ask that you would be with me this morning and that only truth may be spoken from my lips And may your name be praised and honored this morning as we get ready to enter into Psalm 100. Holy Father, we thank you for this opportunity. I do not deserve to be up here, and yet, out of your grace and mercy, you have allowed me to stand before your people to preach your word. Thank you, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so Psalm 100 says... Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. And if we were going to sum up Psalm 100, we would say that it gives us a glimpse of how we are to praise our great God. You may also have picked up that there is a pattern in this psalm, and and you'll notice a flow, and we'll describe it a little later. And this pattern is a doxology and theology pattern. And you may be saying, well, what is theology and doxology, John? But I'm glad you asked that question. Because theology is the study of God, and doxology is an expression of praise to God. Our theology must lead to doxology, Our study of God, which is theology, leads to our praise of God, which is doxology. And we cannot separate these two. If you have theology without doxology, you have cold, dead, 
orthodoxy. But on the other hand, if you have doxology without theology, you end up praising a God who you do not know, which is idolatry, because you're worshiping a God you just made up. So with that understanding, let's go to our first two verses. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Our psalm starts out with doxology. He is passionate as he joyfully worships God with all of his heart. And he also commands us with a joy, to make a joyful noise to the Lord as well. Or another way of saying it is, God's people are to be joyful in order to joyfully worship him, which negates all grumpy gusses. Amen? You can't be an Oscar the Grouch and worship the Lord. And a clear picture for us to see the joy of the Lord is found in an old bookmark uh, that Micah, my oldest uh, daughter, made, who was just up here singing when she was six years old, and I'm sure she's going to be excited about this, um, that she met, wrote and made as she was observing God and his creation. And it reads, birds make music, wind chimes make music, the birds chirp, wind chimes use the wind, but the greatest of all we can sing and play instruments to our God. And what we see so clearly here is her gratitude and joy to the Lord, which it leads to her praise and worship. And so I ask you this morning, are you worshiping the Lord joyfully? And if you're unsure, if you have the joy, joy, joy of the Lord down in your heart, just, yes. <laughs> Just ask yourself, do you marvel at God's creation or are you taking it for granted? Do people enjoy being around you or do you suck the life out of the room? <laughs> Some of it's ringing true, I hear. We can work on this, that's all right. Or are you quick to compliment others or are you quick to complain about them? And as we begin to answer these questions, they will help us to realize if we have the joy of the Lord. And I'm not saying that we are to be in this constant state of happiness because life is hard. We go through trials, troubles, trials, troubles, and struggles. But under our suffering, under the pain is the reality that we have the joy of the Lord because we have Christ and what he has done for us. I mean, think about it. All of those of us who are in Christ, we have gone from death to life, from sinner to saint, from child of Satan to child of God. Oh, how we must have the joy of the Lord as our foundation, as our greatest problem, our sin problem, has been deleted by Christ, which leads to our first point. Shout to the Lord with all your heart, or you'll give love a bad name. Does that sound familiar? I, know, I, I thought about having Herb up here playing a little riff. It does have a little Bon Jovi uh, inspiration. Um, but our lives are to be a lifestyle of praise. It's not only reserved for Sunday morning or special occasions, Living a lifestyle of praise is not like a rash. It doesn't just show up one day and boom, you've got it. No, it's like that other thing. The, the thing that we all need and love. And of course, I'm talking about exercise. That's right. We are gonna have to work at it. But be encouraged, brothers and sisters, because God in his grace and mercy has given us his Holy Spirit He's given us his word, he's given us his church, and he's given us so much more. We must be in, intentional in our thinking and recalling what he has done throughout our day and what he is, is and has do, done in our lives. And if you struggle with thinking about some of these things, here are some practical ways and places 
for us to start building some good routines. So as you're going through your mundane morning routines, getting ready in the morning would be one, as you're washing dishes, as you're moving from place to place, be thinking about what the Lord has done for you, what he is doing. I got this one from Bob Wegel, who's also leading uh, the Ten Commandments at 8.30 upstairs. Um, but it's a drive time prayer list. And I thought this was great. Turn off your radio and just praise the Lord for what he's done in his creation. And call, or call a friend and see if there's anything that they need prayers about. This is a great one. This, this really impacted me when Bob started calling me and asking, asking me if there's anything I needed prayer for. And then just think about it. As you're doing these things, the day is not even over. So you'll have plenty more opportunities to be thinking about it. And then doing it as a family could be done over dinner, during family devotions. And not only are you learning to develop and strengthen these new spiritual muscles, but now your children are beginning to see and learn how to do it as well. And as we grow and become more consistent and intentional with our thoughts, verse two is gonna become so much more natural to us. And verse two says, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing. Charles Spurgeon said this about this verse, our happy God should be worshiped by a happy people. A cheerful spirit is in keeping with his nature, his acts, and the gratitude with which we should cherish for his mercies. And up to this point, the psalmist has been focused on doxology, which you remember is an expression of praise to God. Now in verse three, he introduces some theology for us, which is the study of God. And he's given us the why behind our worship and praise to God. And verse three says, know that the Lord, he is God. And I just want us to pause here for a minute and think about the exact opposite of what our verse says. I mean, what would it mean if the Lord wasn't God? What would happen if the Lord truly wasn't God? And I think we would say that we would gladly take his place and place ourselves as God. I mean, can you imagine a world filled with billions of little pseudo-gods trying to run the world? I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> right? And since we're all gods, we're all super important, we're at the center of all things, and of course, we only answer to ourselves. Meaning, we do whatever is desirable to us, whatever makes us happy, whatever pleases me in the moment. Is this starting to sound a little familiar? I think it's starting to sound like the world we live in today. Church, we have forgotten that God is God and we are not. So I'd ask you, are you currently living like the Lord isn't truly God? Are you the king of your universe or is God? Are you at the center of all things or is God? And a good gauge to know this is, are you trusting or understand and understanding in your own ways and knowledge or are you trusting in God's word? And honestly, when we live like we're pseudo-gods, it's as if we're living like God doesn't exist at all. We become functional atheists. We live no differently than the world. And we end up living like the fool that is found in Psalm 14, verse 1, which says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Oh, church, how we must have the right and correct perspective of where we stand before this holy and righteous God. And remember, we, he is God and we are not. 
And may we never twist this. Now getting back to our verse, verse three, let's read it in, in its entirety. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And in order to honor the Lord with praise that is a sweet and pleasing aroma, there are three truths about God that we must know. And the first know is that the Lord is God. We see here that the word Lord is in all capital letters, which is God's personal name, Yahweh. And the psalmist is telling us here plainly that Yahweh is the true God. Yes, the same Yahweh that used Moses to rescue his people from Pharaoh and the life of slavery by taking them out of the land of Egypt by with his mighty hand. There are no other gods besides him. He reigns supremely over all powers and authorities throughout the universe. Knowing that the Lord is God is just the first knowing. It's just the first step. So going back to our psalm, the second knowing is, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. So know number two is, know that God is creator. He made us. We did not create ourselves, nor did we come into existence by chance or by accident. Sorry, Darwin. No, you are created in the image of God. Or another way of saying it is, you are God crafted, which means you were created intentionally and with purpose. Listen to Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you formed my inner parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Oh, how he cares for us, his creation. I mean, think about an artist and how he cares and cherishes for their creation, which is only made up of charcoal and paints and other mediums. It is not alive. It has no soul. Yet, he cares for it and cherishes it and protects it with great delight. You are far more valuable than this piece of art. And as we begin to understand that God is our creator, so too does our affection for this great God to whom we get to serve also begin to grow. And going back to our Psalm to find our last reason for uh, why we get to praise God Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. No number three is God is our savior. We learn here that God is our shepherd and we are his people. And our good shepherd leads us to green pastures and still waters. Plus, he also protects us from wolves and leads us and gives us safe travels through the passage of the valley of the shadow of death. But we also have to remember on this side of the cross, not only did he create us, but he also bought us. As it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I mean, think about what good news this is for those of us who have repented from our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ. How incredible is it to be owned by the creator of the universe? He purchased us with his precious son's blood that freed us from sin, Satan, sickness, and sadness forever. Now we can start seeing why the psalmist began with doxology. And now that we have some some fresh eyes, let's go back to verse two and reread it again. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, 
all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Oh, how great is our God. He is worthy of all praise, which leads to point number two, to know God and to be known by him. We can't really know ourselves until we know God. It's by knowing God and seeing God rightly that we can begin to look at ourselves and compare ourselves to the one who is pure and holy. Listen to what John Calvin says in book one of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Again, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself until he has first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinizing himself. For we always seem to ourselves righteous and upright and wise and holy. This pride is innate in all of us, unless by clear proof we stand convicted of our own unrighteousness, foulness, folly, and impurity. I mean, what an amazing quote this is. We find here that we cannot know ourselves until we first know God. I mean, think about that. How many people in the world don't know God? Most, right? And as most don't know God, that means they really don't know themselves. I mean, imagine God's holiness shining down on, on us and it opens our eyes and we true and for the first time we begin to see our wickedness and the hidden darkness of ourselves that we were once blinded to. And we finally see ourselves accurately for the first time. We finally get to see who we truly are. This shows the need why we need to know God in order to know ourselves. But the question is, how do we know God? Did we decide one day to just follow him? Or do we believe what scripture says in 1 John 4.19? We love because he first loved us. We see here that God loved us, or we could say it this way, God placed his love on us, and so in turn, we could now love him. This reality sh should lead us to praise him. And as we as now as we approach verse four, the psalmist goes back into doxology. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. We see here that, the, that he's talking about coming into the temple to worship. And it's similar to what we're doing here today, coming into church to praise. So in other words, God people together are full of thanks praise and are to bless his name together. We are a community, a spiritual community that supernaturally praises our God. Amen? Amen? I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of a supernatural family of God? Look around. This is us. This is those of us who are in Christ Jesus those who have turned to Christ Jesus in repentance and faith. God has blessed us with each other. And this leads us to point number three. We are not a community of one. And that means we as Christians, we're not meant to live in isolation. We're not lone rangers or lone wandering prophets. And we get a glimpse of, of this, what this looks like being lived out in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their 
proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I mean, can you imagine being in a community like that? I want you to just take a moment and ask yourself, who do you spend your time with? Do those in your inner circle honor the Lord? And how often are you encouraging others and praising the Lord with them for how he's working in their lives? And I would say, if you are lacking community, just look around again. Here is your community. You're in a room of like-minded believers. We are sinners going through the sanctification process, but we have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfecter of our souls. And with that, if the worship team could start making their way up, And as we move to our last verse, the psalmist is faithful and he does not disappoint us as he finishes out Psalm 100 with theology. Verse five brings this whole psalm together. It's the cherry on top. It says, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generation. The character of God is set before us. His character is what makes everything we've talked about earlier true. I mean, can you imagine if God wasn't good? What would the world look like? How could you serve him with gladness? He would not lead us to green pastures or to still waters. Nor would he lead us safely through the valley of the shadow of death. But praise the Lord that he is good and we do not have to worry about any of those things coming to fruition because he is so good, which leads to point number four. God is good even when we are not. Just think about what Christ has done for us. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight says, why we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is good. God is loving. God is faithful. Through Christ's payment for eternal salvation, This truth endures forever. And I thought we would end this psalm by reading it together, since now that we're just so full of joy and praise. So if everyone could stand, we'll read God's holy word together. All right. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and he is faithfulness to all generations. Amen.